Okay, g'day all and welcome to another video. So today we've got an interesting video. I'm going to call this one Object Oriented Programming is a Dirty Rotten Low Down Trick. <laughs> now I don't want to pay out on Object Oriented Programming. I tell you what, uh, all I really want to do is have a bit of an exploration and adventure into exactly how OO works, uh, in particular C++. The title of this video comes from a quote by Dr. Michael Brady of uh, Trinity College Dublin, <laughs> just a video I watched a long, long time ago. I'll leave a link down below too. Uh, it's all about assembly, but he mentions in it that uh, object-oriented programming is really just a trick. So I thought it'd be fun to make a, a little video exploring some of those aspects just so that we can uh, get a good understanding of how a C++ compiler works or object-oriented programming in general. And uh, that's pretty much what this video is all about. Just before we get started, I'll be putting up an ebook for this video for all of the Patreons, just as a big thank you for supporting the channel. And uh, if you'd like to become a Patreon of the channel, I'll leave a link down below and another one up above. You can go and grab the, uh, the ebook for this video if you like. And another couple of things before we start, I wanna make it super, super clear that what we're gonna do here is break C++. This is not how you code C++, we're just adventuring. Pretty much none of the stuff in this video should ever really be coded. Yeah, don't code like this. Just keep this sort of stuff in the back of your mind as, uh, as an illustration of, uh, of how things actually work in C++. Let's start by talking about access modifiers. So right here we've got a little class and it's got a private integer called x. And the normal way to access private integers like this x just here uh, would be to make a setter just like this one here, set x, and then you'd be right as rain. So if we had uh, int main, something like this, create an instance of my class called a just here, and then we could call the setter, set 25, and then print out the value of x using our little uh, print method. And if we run this, we should uh, rather unsurprisingly see the number 25. Yeah, there you go, 25. But because we marked that variable as private, if we tried to change the variable directly, just set it to a one, two, three, uh, without going through the setter, then the compiler will give us an error and it won't compile. Let's have a look what it says. Member, my class, x, declared at line 6, is inaccessible. But the interesting thing about this is that that's actually just a compiler check. And if you know where the member x is stored in RAM, you can just change it at will, if you want. x is actually stored as the first uh, element of this particular type of class just here. So what we could do is a little trick called type punning. And we'll see this a lot in this video. Uh, it's not recommended in general programming practice to use type punning because it really sort of throws away all of the type safety that a language like C++ gives it. But um, yeah, let's type pun. So if we go something like, <laughs> we make an integer pointer and we point it to A. The compiler's not letting us do that because A is not an integer, as you might notice, is not an integer pointer. Uh, but we can just say, yes, it is like that. And uh, C++ is perfectly happy to point i to the instance of our class. And then from there, we can say star i equals one, two, three. And what you should see is that the member x has been changed to 123. Okay, why does that work? <laughs> um, we've just changed a private member variable from outside of the class. That works because the, the integer i is actually stored at the first address of the instance. Now, in this particular example just here, we haven't got any polymorphism, so we'll, we'll look at this at the very end, but this is not always the case. But generally speaking, if you haven't got um, any virtual functions, then the member variables will just be stored in RAM at the address of your uh, instance. So in our particular case, we've got an instance called A, and the instance actually only has one integer. If we make an integer pointer and we point it to that instance, then uh, we can actually change the member variable x, whether it's public, private, or protected. Things do get a little bit tricky when we've got multiple data items. So if we had here, if we had, um, maybe we have char c just here, and then we have another integer, uh, int b. And I might change this print x here just to print b. At the moment, we've got a little class with three private variables, a fairly pointless class, I'll grant you. What we have to be careful of is the alignment of the data. Usually this will be natural alignment. And what that means is that each of these variables will be placed on an address that's evenly divisible by the size of the variable. There are other alignments and you can change this using a pragma pack directive. But for us, what that means is that this integer just here x will be at the address of the instance. 
That'll be followed by a char C. The character is only one byte wide, it can fit on any address. But then following the character, we have this uh, integer B. The trouble is after a four byte integer X and a one byte character C, there's gonna be three bytes of extra added padding so that that uh, integer B just there can fall on an address that's evenly divisible by four. Then we get four plus one for the character plus three bytes of padding gives you an address that's evenly divisible by four. So if we wanted to change that B variable just there, if we create an integer pointer to the instance and we get I++, plus uh, plus, that I pointer just there at the moment will point to the character C along with the extra padding bytes. If we go I++ plus plus again and we set that to uh, one, two, three, then we print B. Uh, what we should find is that the variable B is now set to one, two, three. I might change it to something else just so that we can see that some, something's actually changed. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So we've changed the B variable by creating a pointer to X, which is at the start of the instance, and then incrementing that pointer so that it points to the char C with its extra three bytes of padding, and then incrementing that pointer again so that it points to B. The access modifiers are really only to protect the programmer. And realistically, there's no type of encryption or anything. I mean, this is not, not hardware level protection. Uh, if you want to change public, private, or protected members, then uh, all you have to do is figure out where they are, make a pointer and change them at will. Yeah, it's interesting stuff. All right, let's move on to member methods. So member methods are interesting. Member methods are actually just perfectly normal C functions, the same as any other function, pretty much, uh, except there's, uh, there's two kind of important differences. One is they will have a mangled name, and the other difference is that they have uh, a secret or an implicit uh, first parameter, which is the this pointer. So to demonstrate all of this, we're going to have a bit of an adventure. Uh, I've got a class just here, point to f. This is just a little 2D vector class. It's got uh, x and y as floats. And we've got a little constructor just here to set those up and a little method for printing out the values of x and y. And down here, I've got a member method add, but I've not implemented that add method just there. So it's got no body to that function at all. And down here in main, we could create two points, a and b. And then we could print out the value of A. If we run this program just here, we get uh, 10 and three, that's the A value. So what we wanna do is write the code for this add method just here, but we wanna do it kind of manually. So if we try to run the code calling this add member method just here, we haven't implemented the member method, so we get an error. Let's have a look at what he reckons. He reckons no, no failed, one failed, come on. Unresolved external symbol, uh, public void C decal point to F, et cetera, et cetera. Goodness gracious me, what were you thinking? Um, but the compiler has given us an error message, which is interesting because it actually contains the mangled name of the function. So the mangled name is a name for the function that the compiler and the linker uses kind of in the background. This is the real name of the function, and it actually includes information on the parameters as well as the uh, class to which the function belongs, the member method belongs. If we just copy this for a second, let's just copy this error message just here and have a bit of a close look at it. Uh, if we just delete all of this stuff about line suppression state, holy macaroni, severity code, mate, it got excited, didn't it? Let's just delete all of this stuff here. Uh, you do need the question mark at the start, and we'll delete this bit here at the end. That right there, is the actual name of the function add. If we want to implement this function just here, then what we can do, if I just copy that and we go over to assembly, uh, we can make ourselves a little proc. So we'll go dot code and we'll paste the name of the method. Something like that. Well, I filled in the rest of the function now. It's, um, it's all assembly language, but you don't really have to understand the mnemonics or anything. It's just, um, just an example of, of exactly what's happening here. What I wanna point out with this, uh, if we run this code just here, uh, we should get A and B added together. Uh, 25 and five is the final vector that we get. So 25 is 10 plus 15 and five is three plus two. So we have successfully implemented the uh, add member method by hand in assembly. What I want to point out is that this assembly function just here, apart from the weird name, uh, this is exactly like a perfectly normal C function. I mean, there's really, there's no difference at all. The first parameter in uh, the Windows calling convention for x64 is passed in RCX. Now this is uh, 
OS specific. I think it's uh, RDI in uh, Linux and then RSI and a whole bunch of other things. In uh, in Windows, the C calling convention passes the first parameter in RCX. Now that is actually the this pointer. Uh, so if we come over here to uh, A, we put a little bit of a break point right there just before we call the function. If we run this and we have a look at A, we just hover over that. Uh, can we get the address of it? Uh, no, it's not telling me the address. Let's just um, let's just code something to get the address of that. I'll just make it a void star and we'll call it um, v equals a. Just so that we can read where uh, a actually is. So we'll run this. Okay, so our void star just here that has read the address of a. Hold on, the um, the compiler has optimized out my amazing line void star v equals the address of a. It says no, it doesn't, mate. I don't know what you're trying to do, but that's not going to do. It's not going to do anything. Um, all right, so I put it back to debug mode just so that we can actually read the address of A. So right there, we've got the address 2338FEFB68. It's obviously hexadecimal. Uh, but then when we come over to uh, our assembly, if we just run a little bit more, what we should see is in RCX exactly the same value, 2338FEFB68. So RCX is actually the this pointer. It's a pointer to the object, which is calling the member method. And the second parameter, which looks like it's the first parameter up here, if you look at the function definition, our second parameter will be O just here. In other words, it will be the B that we're passing as a parameter. So member methods are exactly the same as normal C functions, except they've got mangled names to indicate the parameter types. And they've also got uh, an implicit first parameter, a secret first parameter, which is the this pointer. Okay, and now for the final stretch of this video. What I want to talk about is uh, virtual functions, polymorphism. Let's polymorph something. We've got a little class hierarchy here that I've set up. It's very contrived. It's got animals at the top and then inheriting from animals, we've got dog, duck and fish. And then inheriting from dog, we've got fox. The code is fairly basic. We've got uh, animal at the top, the parent class of everything. And that's got a virtual function, virtual void sound and uh, just prints out the animal makes a sound. Then we've got dog, the dog class inherits from animal publicly. It's also got a virtual function sound. The dog goes woof. And then we've got ducks and ducks can quack. And we've got fish and fish go blurb. <laughs> and then of course we got fox and nobody knows what the fox says. My memes are up to date. I've written a little main function. It starts out by defining a pointer to an animal print out a little menu for the user saying pick a pick a number. Do you want an animal, a dog, a duck, a fish or a fox? And then we just read in whatever the user wants. And then we use a switch to set the pointer, this animal ages here, to an instance of one of the animal types that we've defined above. If we run this program just here, we should see that it's fairly uninspired. Let's go dog, I think. Pick a number. I'm going to go to dog. The dog goes wolf. Unbelievable. This call to sound just here, this A call to sound, uh, is calling whichever of these member methods is appropriate for whatever animal type we choose. And you might wonder, well, how is that, how is that achieved? The instances of the classes themselves own a pointer to the appropriate function. So this means that once you've made an instance, um, you can't change it. If we had a, a fish, star something like that and uh, I just call it f like that equals a new fish now we can obviously call the sound for fish but you might think you might think that you could cast that to an animal uh, like that now the cast is fine the cast is fine you can cast it to an animal star but but the f instance itself has a pointer to the fish's uh, function so when we do this uh, you should see, if we just get rid of this first bit up here. Yeah, so you can see that even though we've cast this F pointer just here to an animal, maybe we tried to call the um, parent classes method up here. It didn't work. It didn't work because the fish instance itself has a pointer to the fish's function. <laughs> okay, that's kind of interesting. That's kind of interesting. But I'll tell you what's, uh, what's possibly more interesting is that the... V table pointer at the very start of an object is just eight bytes. It's just a pointer. And uh, you can point it to whatever you want. So, so let's have a bit of a go at something a little bit, 
Funny. Uh, let's make a fish go wolf. Why not? I'd like to hear a barking fish, a dog fish, if you will. We've got a little example just here. We make a pointer to a fish object and create a new fish. We make a pointer to a dog object and we create a new dog. Then we read as an unsigned long long, this is more type punning. We read whatever is at the address of fish. So we read that into V table A, and then we read the other pointer from our dog instance into V table B, and then we swap them. But after that, we call the fish sound followed by the dog sound. Now, what's gonna happen? Let's have a look. There you go, classic. <laughs> look at that, dog goes wolf, but it was a fish. Look at this here too, fish goes blow, but it was a dog. <laughs> Um, good stuff. All right, rather pointless, rather pointless, but it does go to show that um, you can indeed change which function is called by these virtual function calls at runtime. You just change it to whatever you want. There's just a pointer at the start of the instance. Okay, so how does this actually work? Well, for each class that has virtual functions, there is created a virtual table and the virtual table actually lists uh, addresses for the start of each of the virtual functions. So if you've got one virtual function in your class, then your virtual table for that class will just have one little address. And then if you've got two virtual functions in your class, then your virtual table will have two pointers, one after another. Each class that has virtual functions will have a virtual table created for it somewhere in RAM. And then when we create an instance of the class, the compiler will place a pointer to the appropriate virtual table at the very start of the instance. So every instance of fish will have a pointer at the very start that points to the fish's uh, little list of uh, virtual functions. Likewise, every instance of dog will have its own pointer that points to the dog virtual table. Whenever we're using virtual functions here, you'll find that the V table pointer is at the very start of the instance. So if we had uh, an integer in fish, a member variable, which is an integer, uh, that would follow the uh, V table pointer. So it would be eight bytes ahead of the instance, unlike what we saw at the very start where the data of a class was just listed out the same as the structure. The pointers to the virtual functions themselves, the pointers to the code in the V table, they're listed in the same order that the virtual functions are defined in the code. Uh, a couple of things about these virtual tables. So for one thing, you might think that you could then change the virtual table at runtime. But if you go in and try and change the virtual table, what you'll find is it's actually protected, which means that we cannot change the addresses of the V table at runtime, but the V table pointer, the V table pointer is in the data segment. So we can change that if we want, which means that we can actually define our own V table. I've got a whole bunch of code here now. This is um, a new example. So now we've just got a class called animal and it has three virtual functions because you, uh, you wanna make sure that you can um, manipulate or override all three. We've got three virtual functions. We've got a virtual function called walk and it just says the animal walks. Then we've got a virtual function called sound and it says the animal makes a generic sound. Then we've got grow and the animal grows a bit. And down here, I've got three functions that are not related to the class. So function one, function two, and function three. And they just output something different. So walk function, sound function, and grow function. What we can do is uh, just type def a function pointer because you know if you're dealing with function pointers, you'll often want to type def them. There's such an awkward syntax. After that, I've defined a little table, just an array in the data segment. Well, this actually be stored on the stack, but um, you know, somewhere in, in read writable memory. I've just defined a little array of function pointers. So these pointers point to these three functions, function one, function two, and function three. And then we create an instance of animal and we assign the V table address to point to our little array of function pointers from before. And what's gonna happen if we call walk, sound, and grow? What do you think's gonna happen? Let's run it and have a look. Walk function, sound function, grow function. And if I just scroll up a little bit, that is the user defined functions that we um, put in our little array. So what we've done there is pointed our instances V table pointer, not to its original read only RAM up there somewhere in, in the read only universe, 
um, we've pointed it to our own little array of function pointers. And you're not supposed to do this. The, the vtable pointer by itself is meant to be hidden. I mean, you're not supposed to manipulate it at all. But it is interesting to see that you can actually change the vtable at runtime. Yeah, pretty much while, while the program is running, you can change it to point to whatever you want. And maybe just one more thing that's interesting about these functions just here. The CPU doesn't care what the um, function definition is for these functions here. When we call the functions down here, we need to provide parameters as though um, they were the original uh, virtual functions defined in your class up here. So if walk had, say, an integer, int i, like that, then down here, when we call the function, we would have to supply that integer two, for example. But the definitions for our functions just here, the CPU doesn't even check. It's not even going to check what the parameters are. It's literally just jumping uh, via a function pointer. It doesn't care what the parameter list is. But what that means is that we can pretty much define anything we like here. So we could have um, float x, float y. I mean, it doesn't really matter. What we should do is really match the parameter list from, uh, from up here, this walk just here. So if we had um, over here, uh, well, first of all, there'd be a void star. That's the this pointer. I'll put it this PTR. And then I'll put int x. And see out. Yeah, so you can pass parameters uh, if you want. Just be careful because the first parameter is the hidden this pointer. Um, these are member methods, virtual member methods, but they are member methods. We should get whatever number we're passing here. Oh, that's not going to work anymore. Yeah, sorry, it's not going to work anymore. Oh, I could just cast it. Let's just... <laughs> Tell you what, this type punning is getting out of hand. <laughs> yeah, but there you go. Yeah, there you go. So, so, so you can pass parameters to our little virtual uh, table just here if you want. And um, the very first parameter, you do have to be careful, it is the implicit this pointer. In fact, I might just do that. We'll just print out the this pointer. Um, see out this PTR, just to show that that first parameter is indeed the this pointer. And we'll save it and down here, just before we call all of these functions, I'll just std see out animals so that we get the um, uh, this pointer from main and we can compare that to the this pointer, which is called in our user defined little virtual function. Um, okay, so that'll be the one in main 2a0e2 something 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 CEO. And up here we've got exactly the same uh, pointer being passed to our function. Yeah, so you can pass parameters to these uh, user-defined virtual functions if you want, and you just have to be careful because the this pointer will be first. Just mark it as a void star here. We could actually call it an animal star. And then after the this pointer, you'll have all of your uh, other parameters. And the CPU is, is not type safe itself. I mean, it doesn't care what the parameter list is here. Um, the CPU sees the V table and whatever the list of function pointers is, it just jumps there, you know. Uh, it just jumps to the address of the start of the function. So whether or not the parameters are what these functions expect, I mean, that's just one of the, um, one of the obvious uh, pitfalls and dangers of doing things like this. Anyway, of course, I'd recommend that nobody ever codes like this. Um, it's just an interesting uh, way to explore and see how some of these things work under the hood. If you ever have to do this, I mean, there's better ways to, there's better ways to call three different functions than this. This is just... This is, just, this is just a mess. Anyway, that is pretty much all that I wanted to say on the matter. So C++ is a fascinating language and uh, we've had a bit of an explore today as to how some of the mechanisms of C++ work. And it's really, really interesting to see just how simple uh, the language is when you get right down to it. I mean, this is implemented in a really uh, simple way, uh, obviously just to maintain speed. It's a fast, fast language. Uh, great language. Yeah, one of my all-time favorites. Um, I never meant to bag out C++ here or object-oriented programming in general. I mean, um, Bjarne Strustrup, you know, uh, one of my all-time, all-time heroes. He's an absolute bloody legend. Uh, anyway, what we've been looking at today, you shouldn't uh, code like this at all, but um, I do think it's a very good way to learn how the mechanisms of C++ work if you're interested in that kind of low-level stuff or, or maybe if you're thinking about writing a compiler yourself. Yeah, but it's interesting to see just how different C++ is when you look under the hood and see how things work. And when push comes to shove, if you have a look at how these things work, uh, object-oriented programming is a, is a dirty, rotten, low-down trick. <laughs>